Hey there lads, how's it going? Danny here, and welcome to one of the most screwed up videos I made. Today we're going to make real Irish whiskey. But, in order to follow the proper technology, I need to upgrade my skills. Where's my moonshine vest? Ah, cool! Let's go to Ireland. First of all, the barley is soaked for 40 hours, then it is dried for 2-3 to three days on special ceramic plates heated by smokeless coal. This procedure is necessary to wake up barley grains so they think that it's time for them to grow, and the necessary chemical processes occur inside the grain. Thus barley turns into malt. After this, the malt is grounded on the millstones. Then we add clean water and together with special whiskey yeast strains, it ferments in the fermentation tanks for about 80 hours until the brew is up 10%. That's for me, it already sounds too complicated, but then the fun begins. Distillation. This factory practices triple distillation in huge copper vats. The first distillation takes place until the water starts to boil, to separate most of the water from the brew. Then the second distillation at a temperature of 78.5 degrees with the separation of tails and heads. Then the end product is diluted to 30% ABV and distilled again to get 84% infusion. But it is too strong to age it in a barrel. Then in bulk it is mixed with high quality alcohol and again water so that in the end it turns out to be 64%. Then they age it in oak barrels for 3 years. Barrel construction is a completely different story. I was lucky to talk with Jer Buckley, a fifth generation cooper who told me about his craft. Mostly I was surprised by his tools, well, you know. Generally, I kinda understood what to do. We don't need anything on this table. First of all, we need real barley, clean water and a barrel to soak it. As at the factory, let's start with barley. To turn it into delicious malt for yeast, we need to let it know. Here is its golden hour. Soak it for 40 hours so it is saturated with water and will begin to resuscitate and start chemical processes inside the grain. I poured about 2 liters of water per 1 kilogram of barley. Now let's check our barley. <coughs> <laughs> it's putrefied. Not only the workshop smells like ass, but the fermentation tank is also full of this crap. Okay, bacteria, this time you won. We'll go another way. All containers must be thoroughly washed, at least with soap. The same amount of grain to be poured into a box and filled with water. The thing is that, in addition to dust, there are shitty grains in the package. They must be separated and washed out. Fill the box with water and you'll see a lot of floating crap. It can spoil any nutritional solution. Get rid of it with a net or some makeshift sieve. I used a piece of steel net. After you take out most of the peelings, you need to peel the rest of the grain. The water will become turbid and a bunch of crap will float up. Throw away the peelings and drain the water. Repeat until the water is clear. It's easier to do this at home than in the workshop with no water tap. I covered the barley with 4 cm of water and left it for 8 hours. Let's try to go through the whole technology and see what happens. To save time, I'll take ready-made malt that can be found in a brewery store or you can get it from the moonshiner. Ground it to blend the brew. I have a coffee grinder for this, but this bitch is more useful for a cup of coffee in the morning. It constantly overheats and grinds only small portions, which just sucks. Well, it is better to use an angle grinder from everything for a dollar store and spoil the pan to save a couple of hours. Drill a super hole in the pan to feed the angle grinder in it. I have already made that kind of crap to grind sugar, so why don't we just use it for grain? The knife can be made of stainless steel sheet. It doesn't have to be firm though. In uh, your internets, I saw a guy making a long knife from a red hot iron and it bursted into pieces, ripping the pan apart. There is nothing tricky about the knife. 
Drill a hole in the center to attach it to the grinder and unfold the blades lengthwise. Then we bend them. You can give some leaning to each blade so you can control the vortex inside the pan. We fasten the knife to the grinder through the pan and you can grind a lot of barley at once. Nice! Once the barley is dealt with, it is time to take care of the fermentation tank. After the foxy fuck up, it should be washed thoroughly. I will use hard to find manganese solution. Rinse the entire tank with strong solution and repeat several times until you get rid of unpleasant odor. If it smells even a bit, it means that several million bacteria and their metabolic products are still hanging out inside. After the container is washed, pour the grinded malt inside. Well, I missed something, so the brew might get screwed up. You have to heat up the brew so that most of the starch turns into sugar. But I thought, fuck it, and poured 4 liters of water over every kilogram. So I'll get 5 liters of whiskey out of 25 liters of solution. Next, we use special whiskey yeast. Honestly, I have no clue what the difference is. Maybe this strain is freaking hungry for malt. The ratio for the brew and preferable temperature are written on the package. 20 to 30 degrees. I will use an uh, aquarium heater setting it to 24 degrees. Everything shoved into the tank must be wiped with something that kills the bacteria. For example, with the same manganese solution. I cut the plug and twisted it outside of the lid threading the wire through the ceiling to make it airproof. You know, it's sad to watch the ruin of 25 liters of brew. Yeah, and it stinks like shit. I stick in one of these seals in the center where the hydraulic lock will hang out. It came with a tank. I'll put a bit of manganese in it so that, as they say, it will pack all the joints. There's also a thermometer sticker on the tank. You pull it over and it sparkles. Shake up the mix and put it in the dark, warm place to do fermenting magic. While the brew is getting ready, let's make a moonshine still. First of all, I need a wooden block. There were no suitable stubs in my workshop, so I had to destroy my anvil. Any fucking way, I have to make a bigger one. We should draw up an approximate diameter. We have at least to cut up a rough shape from the stump to fit it in the turning machine. Eventually, the turner decided to get the fuck away from these experiments. I tucked it into using a half of the stump. Then, as usual, here comes an old school turner. The stump should be formed as a bottom of a moonshine still. We are going to make an original moonshine still out of copper. Ready made stills cost a shitload of money. We're gonna make a ridiculous one, but our own. On the sheet, we'll lay out the largest circle that will fit into the turning machine and cut it with tin snips. It is fucking awesome to work with copper after steel. It bends and cuts easily. Center punch the plate, shove it into the turning machine and let it hang. Now we need some kind of a block to smooth out the copper sheet. Maybe I should bother with rotary drawing. It's quite useful. I can get spherical shells without using heavy press plates, CNC and other batch production crap. The tool itself is a round-shaped round robin. Actually, it's better to weld on a ball from a bearing, but as usual I didn't have the proper diameter, so let's fight with what we have. Using this iron rod you can press on the copper sheet and it will bend to take the form of the pattern. Well, I caught a glimpse of these tricks and now I'm gonna do it without knowing what to do. This is the first try, ask all the questions later. First of all, we have to admit that the block sucks ass. It has been constantly turning around and was fucking useless. Maybe the rotation speed is wrong, maybe the grease. I used usual motor oil before drawing. Equipment failure or shit for brains, etc, etc. I tried to do my best, but the copper always got curved. In the end, I decided to burn off copper, because base metals are annealed in water and become soft. This might help quickly. So I tried to burn off copper sheet, although I understand now where I fucked it up. It was possible to press down half of it, but closer to the edge. It wasn't very firm and it began to crumple. In order for everything to be perfect, 
it is necessary to roll up some material into a blank so it holds properly and to burn off precisely this part. Finally, I managed to make a few bottoms and I just had to make a nozzle formed as a megaphone. Let's shuffle a wooden blank for another shape. Again, an old school turner. And now you can roll copper or stretch it out as you wish. But hard luck, it has taken 8 hours, that means it's time to take care of the soap barley that has been saturated in manganese solution. After mixing, a lot of crap floats up. Leave the barley for 5 minutes in manganese solution for sterilization from fungi, mold and all that shit. Then we pour the water out and rinse it again. After which you can pour it onto maturation pan simultaneously getting freaky. Well, the barley dries under an infrared lamp and moistened every hour, let us move on to an anvil beak made out of a piece of scrap. I decided to grind the cone, hoping that it'll help to bend the edges inside the ball. Asshole. Finally, I used it to strengthen the jammed parts. It's time to cut out the middle cone of the cattle. To do this, of course, we could make a shaping, calculate everything. But who gives a fuck? Cut out a rectangle, fold it into some kind of a cone and then put it on a suitable bucket. Fix it with a pair of clamps and what do we have here? It comes together if you ask me and it is copper, it's great for soldiering. Now it's time for oxygen acetylene. It's universal, maybe someday I'll start working with glass. While I was soldiering moonshine still, I used like five kinds of soldiers coated and not with different amount of silver and they're all equally good for copper. The welded joint turned out to be smooth. You can say it's perfect. Then we'll check out how leak proof it is. After the nominal cone is on the table, I propose to fix the teapot. Let's cut off the excess material. In any case, if these scraps won't be used anywhere, we'll melt them in the furnace. I have decided to cut the bottom into petals and bend them. It takes a bit longer to solder it, but these two parts will better link up. After several soldering points have been done, we can warm up some of the copper and hammer it down to the upper part to reduce the gap. You'll save some solder, it doesn't grow on trees, you know? So we have something like a helmet. The hole in the bottom is sealed up. From two sheety details, you can make one proper if you have a golden press iron. The pipe goes up from the kettle, drill through the lid and weld on the pipe. Here you can clearly see how the horn bends in all directions. Again, it's awesome to work with copper. 2 mm gap? Yeah, no problem. Parts are fitted with hammer. Oh, these ancient people. Freeloaders. We soldiered the corner fitting into the pipe at a very vulgar angle. Who are you to tell me what to do after all? We drill a big hole for a nozzle and grind it at 45 degrees on a recently completed bench grinder. You also need to make another hole in the framework for the thermometer. We'll dig it in uh, the lower part, so it will contact with the liquid. This thermometer will show the temperature of the liquid itself, useful for the first distillation. You don't have to cut any thread, you don't have to do nothing, just soldier it, that's all. You only have to get another transmitter to check the temperature of the steam inside the kettle. To do this, simply Flatten a piece of copper tube, soldier it, and so that it sticks at the desired height. You can squeeze it a little with a hammer. We soldier a shot tube to its place. With it, we can collect the exact information about the temperature of the vapors. Now it's time to make a fridge, the part where delicious ethyl alcohol will condense. We strengthen the tube on the table. This time I want to check how the fridge with a straight tube will work. According to my guesses, its efficiency should be enough for such a volume of brew. Seal this tube hermetically inside the pipe through which cold water will flow. Well, when I soldier the entrance and exit for water to it. Now it's a ready-made fridge. Here I went stupefied. 
What to make a count from for the fridge converter? What from, what from? From the same copper, you can hammer out anything you want. What's next? That's right, soldiering. If you blow into a teapot using a soap solution, you can find out where the leaks are. I was really surprised when two of the three leaks were in places of thin drawn metal and one on the thermometer thread. If you need a sealed container, the soldier is a thing. Now, with the help of a burner, we'll make a teapot base. This is a filler rod for argon arc welding. It can be easily bent at a place of heating. The base is ready in less than 5 minutes and it can withstand 20 kilograms at least. Let's put a moonshine still on the... Fuck, the fridge outbalances it. I have to put in a chemical tripod. Steel pot, aka a kettle, aka a moonshine still is ready. It took me two days to make it, but what a stylish thing. It looks so handcrafted, just have to fix the plug. The refrigerator will be cooled using a submersible pump and a pair of tubes going into a large tank with cold water. When it heats up to 20 degrees, we'll change it approximately every two hours, considering that the temperature at the workshop is up to 30. Pump itself is connected in counterflow to the movement of steam. As soon as the water seal stopped gurgling, you can distill the brew. First of all, you should pour it into a more convenient container like water canister. We fill the kettle and the last part of this one part epic begins. We will control the temperature using a small camping burner. The first distillation should separate as much water as possible from the brew. So let's heat it up to 100 degrees. Afterwards we pour it in one container. I think I should put a steam temperature sensor in its place. 85 degrees. It will be useful for further distillation. After reaching 97 degrees, this is almost the water boiling point. We stop the process and pour in some more brew. You have no idea how long does it take. When the required amount of brew is distilled, it has to be diluted to 30% for redistillation. Considering the turbidity of the solution, I dare say that there is not only alcohol, because alcohol with water is transparent and it's, well, vodka. Ethers, aldehydes, methanol or fusel oils create turbidity. Honestly, I don't know. I know that they shouldn't be there. Therefore, we start to distill again. We pour out what was in the teapot and fill it with a 30 degree brew. Now we need to fine tune the thermometer and the burner so that it slowly approaches to 78 degrees. Heads, them stinky bastards that smell like acetone, will evaporate. I wonder how much of these did I drink during my early days? The steam is 66 degrees Celsius and the first drops started to appear. The smell of heads is really harsh and pungent. Starting from 78 degrees Celsius, uh, the boiling point of ethyl alcohol, and up to 82 degrees Celsius, the heart will be distilled and that's what we need. The first drop slowed down, but it still smells like acetone. It was too early to put up a container for alcohol. Let the heads drip out first. When the solution smelled like alcohol, I decided I should use uh, an online moonshine calculator. And as a result, the calculations came together. 85 grams of heads, but I still poured out the first 100 grams, well, just in case. It was a long process. You won't even believe it. Time stood still. You can say it was eliminated. Sometimes it seemed endless. Well, these fucking drops, the scent of whiskey and the expectation... The... Well, okay, I'll make a burned oak stick. The stick will be cut from a piece of a real Irish barrel. From oak, which even after the cutting smells familiar. Generally speaking, it is necessary to boil it than to dry it up. But let's see what kind of infusion we might get. 10 centimeters per 1.5 centimeters is fine per a liter of moonshine. I'll cut it in half. After the first distillation, we got 75%, which again must be diluted with the water to 30% for a third distillation. The solution became not so turbid, but it can get clearer. 
pour out what was boiled and fill it in a clean product. We can keep a small fire 90 degrees of liquid and the temperature of vapors from 78 to 81. Of course, do not forget to constantly change hot water. Drip, drop, drip, drop, drip, drop, drip. As a result, after the third distillation, alcohol was increased by a couple of degrees, according to this alcohol meter. Therefore, the moonshine turned 78 to 80 degrees. I will dilute it with water to 60 and throw in an oak block. If you shake the jar with booze, you can see that the product, as a result, is not as cloudy as after the first distillation. It looks just like a noble drink. Here it is, real, homemade, single malt triple distillation whiskey. I decided to call it Blind Craster because I have some doubts about the fermentation process and the number of tails in the product. Anyways, we will find out only when it brews, from one week to about a month. But barley didn't grow through, through the week. Plants don't like me, and that's a fact. Some grains began to sprout, but there should be three times longer for making a brew. There were others, of course, but there were very few. Basically, they looked like this. Seems like they lack something. Maybe daddy's care? Well, uh, fuck them. Now I have a steampunk copper moonshine still and a half a liter of whiskey. That was a difficult video. Press a fucking like button and subscribe to our channel. It helps me to make more videos. Yes, and I have a shitload of technology you haven't seen. In any case, thanks for watching. It was Danya Krastyar, as they call me in Russia. See you later, guys.